Uh, we are very happy to have Ambassador uh, Michael McCall uh, together with us. Uh, those of you who watch Russian TV probably know a lot about Michael now. Uh, but uh, uh, we at the New Economic School also know the other part of the other side of, of uh, Michael, the academic side of, of uh, Ambassador McCall, who actually uh, who's, who, who's actually a tenured professor of political science in Stanford. Uh, he was also deputy director of the Center for Democracy, Development and Rule of Law at uh, Fremont Sporting Institute for International Relations at Stanford. He's also a fellow at Hoover Institution. He studied in Stanford uh, for his undergraduate and master's degree, and then he was a Rhodes Scholar, uh, which is a very prestigious scholarship in the in, at the Oxford University, where he also completed his PhD in 1999. Since then, he's written extensively on uh, democratization, on, pol on political regime change, uh, including a, a very famous book on, on Orange Revolution, but also, uh, on, also on other democratizations. And he's, in, that, in that capacity, he's very well known for um, his uh, work on uh, political science of, of uh, democracy. Uh, promotions and the democratization strategies um, around the world. Um, Mike, I should I should say that before becoming ambassador, Mike was a special assistant to the, to the president of the United States, Barack Obama, and uh, director for Russia and Eurasian Affairs at the National Security Council. Uh, and in that capacity, he attended the commencement address by President Obama in 2009, and, and was a very important uh, part of arranging this visit, the first and only visit of U U.S. President uh, Barack Obama to Russia, and uh, uh, we uh, we still remember this this event very uh, uh, very fondly, and uh, and would like to thank Mike for helping us uh, uh, to arrange to arrange that visit. Uh, now, Mike is also well known as an architect or one of the architects of Reset. Of course, Reset is. Uh, the policy designed and implemented uh, by um, uh, U.S. President, U.S. Vice President, but Mike as a special assistant to the President was a very important part of that undertaking, and today he will talk about the theory below, behind the reset uh, and also the outcomes and, and the future of the reset. Thank you. The floor is yours. First of all, it's a great honor for me to be here at the New Economic School. Uh, I've known about the school for a long time, back when I was a professor at Stanford. We've had your professors come on Stajarovki uh, at the center that I used to, to run uh, on democracy development and rule of law. Uh, we've published some of your papers as working papers, including your rector, uh, one of the, uh, a very interesting paper that had a profound impact on a paper I later wrote on the relationship between political institutions and economic growth. Um, and at one point I thought about perhaps uh, speaking about that, and maybe another time we'll come back to that. But uh, I'm here today not as a professor. Uh, I'm here today as uh, uh, the ambassador, and so I thought it would be more appropriate to talk about uh, U.S.-Russian relations. Before I get to that, though, and let's go to that. There we go. Uh, uh, it was truly uh, a historic moment uh, when my then boss, and still boss, because he's still my boss, uh, President Obama was here. Uh, I can tell you, now I can tell you three years later, that the, um, uh, the competition for where the President should speak was fierce. Uh, and there was a lot of debate in our country and in my government about where he should speak. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the details of who won and how you won, but uh, all I can say is that I personally am very excited and proud of the fact that he spoke here. And Preparing for this talk, I think I lost, your, your technology here is actually higher technology than we have at Stanford. Stanford. Uh, as I was thinking about this talk, um, I actually went back and I read the President's speech. And we made copies for you if you want to look at it. Uh, I think it's a hell of a speech. I think it's a really great speech. And worth reading and reflecting on what were our ambitions back at the beginning of our administration, and now compare them to the results and the realities of what we've done over the last three years. And before I begin to give you my theory, our theory of the reset, uh, for those of you who haven't read the speech, uh, let me tell you, the speech is not about U.S.-Russian relations. It's not about 
It was not a speech about how we need to have better relations between our two countries. Actually, it was a speech where the president outlined his view of America's place in the world and our, our kind of foreign policy objectives as a new administration. And there are five main arguments in the speech, and I won't go through them now, but at the end of each one of them, the coda was, here's what we want to do, and why is that not in Russia's interest as well? Why can't we cooperate? And, and so I urge you to go read the speech and then give us your grades based on what we've done compared to where we were on that. And let me go back to that and, and remind you uh, where we started when we came in. Um, I don't want to have a long historical uh, discussion. In fact, I want to keep away from the history of other administrations and just talk about our administration today. But I think any reasonable person would look at the, the relationship between the United States and Russia in the fall of 2008 and come to the conclusion that it was a rather tense, difficult time in U.S.-Russia relations. Here are some of the factors uh, that, that were on our minds at the time when we sat down with the president to talk about how to, to, to do the policy review vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. Um, and it's the first one that I want to really emphasize, and it's the one that President Obama, when he met with President Medvedev for the first time in April 2009, he used this phrase. He said, there was a dangerous drift in U.S.-Russia relations. That we, we just weren't interacting, we just weren't really talking. We had some of these things like the war in Iraq and later uh, in August of 2008, that conflict that got in the way. But it was more profound than that. We just weren't really on the same path. That was his view. Um, and when we sat down with him uh, as President-elect Obama and later as President Obama, we, next slide, that's my first day in the Oval Office ever, a uh, brand new guy. Uh, he's calling your president that day. That's our second day at work. And, and by the way, for those who know our American system, nobody told me, I, I was an untrained White House official that day, you're not supposed to put your hands on the president's desk. Uh, nobody told me. And when my wife saw that, she's like, man, that's a pretty aggressive stance. But uh, I learned later the, the rules of, of uh, decorum in the Oval Office. But as we sat down to review the policy, the president kept asking, uh, we would tell him about the problems we had, and we would tell him about the Cold War clashes, and we would tell him about some of the personalistic dynamics of the previous administration. And he would keep coming back to us and say, hey, I got all that history, but I'm a new guy. I'm a forward-looking guy. I am not uh, uh, a relic of the Cold War. I'm not a child of the Cold War. I want to develop a different kind of relationship with Russia. And I don't understand. We call it path dependencies in terms of economics and political science. But he wanted to reject path dependencies and these kind of historical legacies and to say, hey, we can do something clean here because of who I am and because he thought of who President Medvedev was, a new guy also not constrained by the past. And that's the origins of the word, Perezad Ruska. Uh, that we can just start anew and, and move this in a different place. And because I am a social scientist uh, at heart, and I will return to Stanford, and I look forward to a collaboration with Resh uh, in those coming uh, uh, years, but not now, uh, we, and this is my language superimposed on the process, but we had a policy review. And in my view, there were six uh, tenants principles, assumptions, actually some are assumptions and some are principles, by the way, there, there's a tension there. And for the social scientists in the room, you, you would appreciate that. So it's not really a theory, it's, it's some assumptions and some principles. But let's start with uh, 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 the, the most important thing. And he said it here before you when he was here three years ago. And that may sound like a simple banal concept, that first one, that the United States and Russia share some common interests. But that's actually a highly contested hypothesis. It's a highly contested assumption uh, in my government, in, in, in previous administrations, and even, if I can speak frankly, in my government when we came in, in January 21st, 2009. Uh, but that came from the president. And it's a simple idea that in the 21st century, we have to look for win-win outcomes. It's a phrase he likes to use, and I, I went back and looked. He, he rejects zero-sum thinking. 
uh, two, plus, two points for Russia means two minus points for the United States. He just doesn't see the world that way. By the way, this is a concept that he uh, uses to think about uh, uh, foreign policy around the world. This is not something particular to the U.S.-Russia relationship. Uh, that's the first uh, premise or first hypothesis. Second idea is that we have to develop a multi-dimensional relationship with Russia. And by that, he means not only talking about arms control, uh, international crises, but economic engagement and societal engagement as well. And I remember very vividly uh, a meeting in the Situation Room, it's where we have all our big uh, discussions at the White House, when we were working through the START Treaty. And it was a very important treaty. I'm very proud of that treaty. I worked a lot on that treaty personally. It's a great, it's a great outcome, we think, for the United States. We'll let you do your assessments for your country, but we think it's a it's a win-win. And but at one point, the president and a few other people said, "Hey, we're doing the same thing that Brezhnev and Nixon did. They were talking about the same stuff. We've got to be able to move this relationship in a different direction." So at the end of his eight years, and already back then he was calculating about eight years, uh, that we will have transformed this relationship to not just be about nuclear weapons and international crises, but these other dimensions. How do you do that? Uh, again, it may seem fairly obvious, but this is a very contested idea. If you go back and you look at the history of US-Russian and US-Soviet relations, the means by which we achieve those win-win outcomes along multi-dimensions is through increased engagement. And now, just to, again, I, I, so I'm not an academic, I, I, I'm tempted, you know, what's the null hypothesis here? What's the alternative theory? The alternative theory would be less engagement, but more coercive ways to, to, to get to our outcomes, right? Engagement's not the only strategy. And other administrations have, have deliberately practiced different strategies for achieving their outcomes about their national interest. Our approach, driven by the president, was increased engagement is the means to get to the outcomes that we desire. Fourth, and these are now uh, more principles than hypotheses or assumptions. We, uh, well, they're assumptions as well. We believe that it is possible to practice what we call dual track engagement. That is, to engage with the government in issues of mutual interest. And so, just to give you an idea of, of my life, my day-to-day -day life, uh, yesterday, I was in meetings with Mr. Dvorkovic, somebody you know well, Mr. Shuvala, Ms. Dibulana, uh to engage government officials to government officials to achieve outcomes we desire. The day before, I was with your officials talking about North Korea. Uh, tomorrow will be a, a different set of issues. We do that every day. That's part of the reset. But in parallel, and at the same time, we believe in direct engagement with non-governmental actors. And by that we mean business, civil society, uh, political uh, groups, and, and, and non-organized groups like you. Direct engagement, here I am. I am executing our policy of the reset by standing before you and talking to you, not mediated through Rector Guria to tell you what we think. Not mediated through these guys, right? Not, not, or not mediated through the Russian government, but directly engagement. That, that's our idea. By the way, we stole that idea from the Reagan administration. And if you're interested in the historical origins of that, we can talk about that in questions. Fifth, we believe that we can reset relations with Russia. This is, again, at the beginning of our administration. These were our assumptions. Uh, without... Uh, having to change our relationships with other important countries that we have, both around the world and in your neighborhood. And sixth, and perhaps most controversially, so I want to make sure I say this slowly, that everybody understands what I'm saying, that we think that we can uh, uh, pursue these different objectives along many different dimensions without linking them together. And that is to say that we want to treat the issue of uh, WTO, which, which again, another uh, uh, very difficult negotiation that I was uh, very intimately involved with, without linking that discussion to issues that we have concerns, say, about human rights 
or concerns we have, say, about Syria. It's a very, it's very deliberative that we're going to keep these tracks in different places. The reason we believe that is that we believe if that we link it all up together, it'll be very difficult to achieve progress in these various places. And, to jump ahead, we believe that progress in some areas will help over time to create momentum in these other places. But if you start by linking them all together, you'll achieve nothing. Now let me be very clear, because there was some misunderstanding the last time I talked about this. This is the Obama administration's strategy. What the Russian government, what President Medvedev before and now President Putin today, what they believe about all this, you need to invite them and ask them. That's not what I'm here to do today. I'm here to explain to you our theory of the reset and the way that we are seeking to approach how to develop this relationship. So I want to be clear about that. This is our assumptions based on our assessment of our national interests. And, and, and by the way, you did not see in any one of these slides uh, the theory of the reset is to improve our relationship. That's actually not, that's not where we start from. We start from this theory to achieve concrete results. And through that, we believe the relationship improved, not the other way around. It is not our job to, to, to improve relations. It's our, it's our job, including me now as the ambassador, to advance the, America, uh, the interests of the United States the way we define them, in security matters, in economic matters, and in uh, what we call universal values matters. All right, that's the theory of the reset. The means, I've already talked about them, but I want to just illustrate quickly, because I'm going to go fast through a lot of these slides. Uh, they're more illustrative than things I need to say precisely. That's what I see, I have to lose your time. Uh, yes, you should. Um, the means, how do you engage? What does that mean to try to engage with Russia in a more uh, active way? We have tried to use a variety of different strategies, a variety of different instruments. Deepen engagement at the top, structure our contacts horizontally across the government, create the conditions for our business communities to engage, and finally, try to create permissive conditions for more societal contact. That's the idea. Four different kinds of ways. There could be more, but these are the four most important. So, increased interaction at the top. Uh, here we are, July 2009. My president meeting with your president. By the way, in a room that's fancier than any other room at the White House. Uh, president Obama uh, was struck by that as we walked out and said, man, they got some really nice digs here, but a lot better than what we have in the West Wing. The so West Wing, for those of you who don't know, the White House is this big, very beautiful building. The West Wing is this very tiny offshoot where the ceilings are really low and very crowded. And I said, yeah, Mr. President, you're right about that. Uh, but don't, don't forget the history. Uh, there was a little revolution as a result of all this accumulation of wealth. He said, ah, I got it, I got it. Now I understand why we have low roofs. Uh, Second, uh, more engagement of government officials. That's uh, with the Prime Minister on that same trip. Uh, again, June 2010, when your president came to visit us. Again, Moscow 2011, when the Vice President came to see your government. And again, last summer, when your Foreign Minister was meeting with Secretary Clinton in Washington. High level, very active engagement. And, and I, don't, I haven't counted up the minutes but I think compared to other administrations, you'll find that President Obama personally has spent a lot of time engaging with, with your senior leadership in, turn, in trying to make this relationship work. Frankly, more time than I would have ever predicted as a professor at Stanford before I came to work with him. Uh, he truly thinks that he is uh, doing something transformational in terms of this account, and that he personally, therefore, has been quite engaged. Second mechanism is something we call the Bilateral Presidential Commission. Uh, lots of working groups, and the whole idea here, in a very decentralized way, is just increased connectivity between our governments along lots of dimensions. Third, engaging business. This is just a photo, although we could have a thousand photos, of the, 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 your CEOs and our CEOs meeting in Washington and meeting with the government officials up there. You can't see them, but the two presidents there uh, Secretary Locke and, and then Minister Nabulina chairing a, a session with them. And obviously, engagement between business and your government 
and engagement between our government and your business happens all the time. It need not uh, necessarily be orchestrated by our governments together. Again, just illustrative, this is a group of venture capitalists, uh, investors that came from Silicon Valley, where I'm from, um, and you know, uh, they came mostly to meet with companies, they came mostly to learn about your, uh, what you're trying to do in terms of high-tech companies looking for investments, but the fact that the president met with them and spent two hours talking to them made a profound impact on them, I can tell you. That mattered to them in terms of the understanding what is going on here. We try to do the same when your folks come to our country. And then finally, on the society side, engaging civil society, obviously we do this at, as a matter of course. That's the vice president when he was here last. I think you probably know some of these other folks. Uh, I do this as a matter of course uh, as part of my job as ambassador. The president, of course, did it here. If you can't see that, that's uh, Gennady Zugana sitting with President Obama. Uh, and Mr. Nemsov, I think, is there, and Mr. Grossman, and, and Mr. Panamaryov, and Mr. Kasparov, you can't see them. In other words, you know, your political leaders, uh, just I know there was a lot of no noise about what I met with these same folks. Uh, President Obama did it last uh, 2009. That's our policy of the reset. And it means engaging with everybody, uh, not just uh, opposition. It means engagement with all political groups, as long as they buy, abide by certain norms of, of, of democracy that we ourselves define for ourselves. Okay, that's the means. And most importantly, let's just skip a couple here, direct engagement from the most important communicator that we have on our, society, on our team, uh, not mediated by NGOs or the press, but directly from him to you. We think that's vitally important. Okay, what have we accomplished from all this? Let's just jump to that. Well, before we do, let, let me just one back. Peer-to-peer -peer dialogue. Let me just say a word about this, because this is something, frankly, that is a new initiative of the Obama administration that I also have to say has achieved so far limited results. And the idea is a simple one. The idea is that, well, to back up a bit, if you go back 20 years ago, and you remember how American NGOs and American foundations first came to Russia and actually to the Soviet Union to engage with civil society. And they did, and they continue to do that. And in questions, I'm sure we can talk more about that. And that's good. We support that. We think that's great. Our new idea, however, is rather than kind of a foundation to a client relationship. And that's an important part, and, and I used to be in academia, and, and I love foundations and rich people. I don't know about you, Sergey, Rector, uh, but for what I used to do in my job, uh, heads of foundations and really rich people are very important people to engage. Uh, and we all have to do that to keep our institutions alive. And at the same time, our idea was we want to create more connectivity directly between American NGOs and Russian NGOs and get the government and the funders out of it. And we have something called the peer-to-peer -peer dialogue. We have some grants about it. And maybe if some of you are interested, we, I can steer you in that direction. It's hard to do because your NGOs and our NGOs are so focused on their own internal problems, it's hard for them to think about your problems, right? Uh, and this is a great example. This gentleman came out with us. Uh, he used to work with Barack Obama in Chicago on urban development in Chicago. And I talked to him afterwards, he's like, yeah, it's really interesting to hear about the urban development problems in Russia, but you know, my place pretty full. Uh, we, got some, we had a lot of hard problems in Chicago. So we're looking for ways in, in the spirit of, of lessons learned to try to increase that kind of connectivity and to do that virtually as well. So maybe more on that later. All right, results. I'm gonna go really fast through these. And if you, if you can't follow them, we'll just send you the slides because I wanna get to the conclusions and take your questions. First, security. Um, actually, this is Prague, where we, uh, I think it's Prague, maybe it's not. No, no, that's, that's Moscow, never mind. Uh, security, New START Treaty. Great, fantastic treaty. We think it's in America's national interest. Uh, there's what we got done, and in record time, there's been no treaty of this uh, magnitude ever done as fast as we did it uh, when we came into office. Second, Afghan transit, and what we call the Northern Distribution Network. For American national security interests right now, there's no greater 
uh, challenge and, and arguably has to be at least in the top five of our security uh, you know, top priorities is to supply our troops. And by the way, to also get them out as they begin to leave next year. So this transit system, of which Russia is an integral part of, maybe the next slide now, Ruben, just to give you a, a sense of what we do together, this, we think, is a fantastic achievement of the reset. Third, more generally, cooperation on Afghan security. Um, and, and I think a lot of this is not as well known as the Northern Distribution Network. But we cooperate, military to military, to do things in Afghanistan. Most importantly, is about energy. And maybe you've heard about the Manas Transit Center, which is where our soldiers transit in and out of Kyrgyzstan to go into Afghanistan. The, the, the supplier of fuel for Manas and a lot of other operations is from Russia. Uh, and we have transformed that to make it an even more solid relationship over the last uh, several years. Without that, it would be a much more difficult operation to do. Second, your, your helicopters, uh, which are, are part of that. And third, getting into these other areas of small arms, uh, counter narcotics, and intelligence sharing, which we've, we've uh, improved quite a bit, given that we feel that we have common enemies in that part of the world. Fifth, I believe I'm on. Uh, other military cooperation. We now do all kinds of things that we would have never done five years ago, most, uh, let alone 25 years ago, in terms of training, exercises, information exchanges between our militaries, um, and most interestingly to me, um, just last week, I think maybe they're still there, your Spetsnaz, we're training with our Spetsnaz uh, in Colorado, your parachuters, uh, in a counterterrorism operation. That's a concrete result of the reset. Sixth or seventh, Iran. Again, for us, these are our priorities for our security interests. I'll let, I'll let you tell me what Russia's are. I'm not, that's not for me to judge. But this is our, one of our top priorities in terms of security around the world. And mostly, not always, but mostly, we have been in very close cooperation with your government over the last three years. First and foremost, at the beginning, in trying to create inducements for the Iranians to come along in terms of, of what we sought in terms of their nuclear program. And then when that didn't work, and, and the Iranians rejected us and you, Russia and the United States together, they rejected our offers. It's, it was called the Tehran Research uh, Reactor Proposal. I could talk about it in questions. We then went together to the United States, uh, United Nations Security Council, the UN Security Council Resolution 1929, and passed together the most robust set of sanctions that we've ever had against Iran. We did that together. And we're still in very close cooperation in terms of the P5 plus 1 negotiations, the next round of which will be hosted here in Moscow in about 10 days' time. Seventh, North Korea. Again, I won't go into I want to get to other things. I won't go into the details now. The, the bottom line message here on North Korea, and we just had a set of negotiations with uh, your Ministry of Foreign Affairs three days ago. We basically have the same objectives and are pursuing more or less the same means to achieve them on North Korea. Ninth, counterterrorism cooperation. I already mentioned this. Uh, doing things together in ways that we never did before. Tenth, I'm going to go faster now. Uh, there, oh, there's, the, there's our guy, shaking hands, jumping out of planes together. Uh, and nobody got hurt, uh, which is important to success. Tenth, I believe I'm on. I'm losing count. Ruben, help me. Cybersecurity. Uh, again, doing creative things together that we never did before, and there's more in that story coming in the next, really in the next coming days, weeks, and months, given our common interests and our common threats that we have uh, out there on the internet. Eleven, something that the President, President Obama feels very strongly about, lockdown of nuclear materials around the world. He set this four-year deadline, we're about halfway there. Russia is a central partner in everything we're doing on that front. Thirteenth, I think I'm at, NATO Russia. Um, I hear a lot, I read a lot of your newspapers, I, I hear about uh, all this conflict we're having in terms of NATO Russia, but when I sit at the table and, and, uh, and, and, and talk about concrete things, we see a lot more progress there than, than disconnect. And even on missile defense, which I'll talk about in questions because I'm going to run out of time, we are quite optimistic 
that when we just sit down and talk about our common threats and our real capabilities, that is, we have a fact-based discussion about what we plan to do and what we can and cannot do, we think this is going to be a win-win for Russia, the United States, and our allies in NATO. All right, that's security. Now I want to pivot quickly to the economy. Not, not as big a story, but still a positive one. And now I think I'm on 15 or 16. Somebody should count for me, okay? 13? No, no, 15. Uh, WTO. Three, four administrations promised to work with your government to do it. Uh, and we did it. It was a hard, hard negotiation. Uh, and, and, and by the way, that's something I want to say. I'm just rolling these off in like 10 second intervals. Every single one of these slides, for me, is hundreds if not thousands of hours of my life, including this one. Uh, arguing about pork, arguing about autos, arguing about uh, ractopamine. In fact, we were just arguing about ractopamine again with Mr. Shuvalov yesterday. Uh, every one of these things may look like easy, no-brainer, low-hanging fruit. It certainly didn't feel like that way at the time as we were negotiating these things. Especially closing out a negotiation that went on for 18 years, we got it done. 16, one, two, three agreement that allows for nuclear civilian cooperation between our two countries. Again, something that had been lingering literally for about a decade. We got it done in the last three years. 16 or 17. This slide, slide is, is really, the, you know, the, the trend line is right. Trade is going up. The highest amount of trade we've ever had between our two countries was last year. Uh, 42 billion, almost 43 billion. Uh, the downside, of course, is that this is a really small number if you look at our, the size of your economy and our economy. But at least the trend is in the right direction. And again, we'll just, I'll just fly through these. Uh, but this means... Uh, Investment of our companies in your economy. And here are just some big examples. Uh, trade and investment, uh, again, uh, here I'll just, these are just listed. The Boeing deal, the ExxonMobil deal. Uh, but I also want to remind you, this, this crowd probably knows this better than most, it also means investment from Russia into our economy. And as uh, the, the head of the US, uh, USTR Ambassador Kirk said this morning in his speech, we seek Russian investment in our economy. We see that as creating jobs, creating a value. We want to see that. Uh, and that's part of our, what we're trying to do, create those permission co conditions to see more of that. All right, 18th or 19th, innovation cooperation. Your former president made this a top priority. He said there needs to be more innovation. We said, we agree. We want to do what we can. We also said, very soberly, that at the end of the day, this is not so much a question for governments. Uh, you can't dictate this from the, from the Kremlin or the White House. You have to create the permissive conditions for creative people like you to go and do creative things at innovative companies. And what that list is are, are you know, we can talk about maybe in questions. There's some things governments can do and there's something governments can't do. But we want to be a cheerleader for the, these kind of innovations. So it means setting up uh, a working group on innovation. We did that. If it means setting up a working group on rule of law, we did that. Uh, your former president wanted to come talk about these things with uh, Obama when he visited in 2010. And I said, well, why don't you go to California first? That's where innovation is. That's, that's my home, right? That's where this stuff is really happening. And really, in a rather unprecedented way, usually you come to the White House and then you go somewhere. Your president went to Stanford and Apple and, and Cisco uh, first. And that, to me, was innovative uh, diplomacy, but also good for trying to stimulate this kind of dialogue. 19th or 20th, society. I don't know if you can see it. That's Barack Obama. These are uh, uh, Russian basketball players. I'm off to the right making lots of three-point shots. Uh, and there's your ambassador back there, Ambassador Kislyak. He didn't want to play. Um, society, society, context. Have we achieved anything yet? Uh, let me just highlight three and then get to the current stage. New agreement on visas, signed in July 2011, allows for multiple entry three-year visas uh, for everybody. 
Well, most everybody, you got to qualify, but 90% of you will if you apply. Uh, we're just waiting now for the Duma to ratify that agreement. We think it's a great agreement. Likewise, new agreement on adoptions, that's moving through your system. We think that's good uh, for this kind of cooperation. Third, American Seasons, a project that we had here to try to bring American uh, artists of all sorts uh, uh, to your country. Uh, vice versa happens. We think that's about societal to societal contacts as well. And travel has increased. There's the statistics. We hope after this new agreement is done, that number will go up even higher. And then finally, in terms of these things, and I don't have time to do it, but every single day, there are Russians and Americans meeting to do things that, that are interesting and creative. Whether they're the big ticket items like space, or whether they're these little things like text for baby, which was a simple technology that uh, somebody invented, you know, did in the United States, just a way to get mothers in rural areas without access to uh, hospitals, just to get them basic information about their new babies. And uh, interesting where this came from, if you want to know, there's this guy, Ashton Kutcher. I, I've never heard of him. He's an actor. Uh, huh? Correct, although I don't know where the, the status of that relationship is right now. Uh, I'm not an expert on those things. He's the biggest guy in Twitter. Correct. He came to your country about three years ago as part of a White House State Department tech delegation. And by the way, I, I approved it. I was working at the White House, and a lot of people said, what in God's name are we doing putting a movie star on a delegation like this? And people laughed about it, and people said a lot of silly things about it. Well, two things happened because of him. One, he's, I, I don't know what his fo uh, followers are up uh, to now, but they're in the millions. And the very fact that he was there helped to create a lot of synergies among people that otherwise would have never known. I think the head, the head of Twitter was also on that delegation, if I'm not mistaken. But second, as a result of that one week, this, this idea came out. And they said, why can't we do that here? And it took a while, two years later. And now this has been launched. And I could give you... 300 of those ideas that happen every single day. And, and the reason I, I wanted to remind you of that is because sometimes I read in your press about all the conflict in U.S.-Russian relations, and none of this ever you know, filters in. I encourage you to you know, go to our website, follow me on Twitter, because I, I talk about it, because this stuff is also happening every single day. Okay. And I can't because I know there's academics here who know the difference between causation and correlation. Uh, so I'm not going to make any bold statements about cause and effect here. But what I will show you is some data, which is, I'm an academic, so I care about data. Uh, we see the trend lines in terms of favorability going in the right direction. And, and this is a complicated slide that is just Russian attitudes about America. You can, if you go way back, you can see where we started at a positive place. Uh, in the early 90s, you see the dips are, are directly correlated, I think there's a causal effect here, about foreign policy initiatives. Uh, it's moving in the right direction. It peaked, I think, at 62% uh, in, the, in the spring of 2010. It's dipped a little now, but it's still moving in the right direction. But I also want to show you this slide, because I think this is frequently mischaracterized here when I hear discussions about American attitudes about you. 93% of Americans 20 years ago did think you were the enemy. There it is. Friend or foe, 93%. Pretty overwhelming uh, statistic. Not true anymore. Now it's 37, uh, with 61 having a favorable attitude. And by the way, in another poll, if you're interested in this stuff, when Americans are asked to name the number one enemy of the United States, I think it's a Gallup poll, and I can send you it if you're interested, um, uh, only 2% of Americans named Russia, 2%. And I think the margin of error was 4% for the poll. 1% in the same poll named the United States of America as America's greatest enemy, just to give you a, a sense of where you stand in terms of our, you know, our worrying about you as, uh, in terms of that stuff. And moreover, just to give you, uh, you know, a, 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 a little bit of a flavor, and again, if you're interested in all the breakdowns, happy to send this to you, but you shouldn't be surprised that this, the, you know, the younger people, of course, have a different attitude than those that were around for the Cold War. Okay. 
That's a tremendous record of achievement from our perspective. Uh, I think, again, I'll let the historians judge, I'll let others judge. I don't want to get into comparing uh, from previous administrations. But when we look at where we started, and when we look at what the expectations were about where we were going to go, and I encourage you, if you're interested in this, go back and read some of the reports where they were coming out of your country and that were coming out of my country in the fall of 2008 about U.S.-Russian relations. When we look at that, and then we look at the ambition that President Obama set out here at the New Economic School, and then when we look at the results, we feel pretty good about where we've, got, where we've come from and, and, and in terms of this record of achievement. Issues for the future are tough. They're tough in part because the so-called easy things, like WTO, like the New START Treaty, like UN Security Council 1929, uh, none of those were easy, just so you understand. None of those outcomes were easy. But now that they're done, what's left are harder issues, number one. And number two, uh, obviously things that, that come about that we don't control. When we were writing our transition papers, for instance, about Russia, uh, Syria was not an agenda, obviously, because that, we were, we, that we were not anticipating what was going to happen in Syria and the rest of the Middle East. Um, these are the, the near-term issues. I want to end, there, therefore, well, almost end, also on approaches and come back to the theory. Because we've laid out our theory, and we think it's important to keep, to keep pushing at that agenda. Uh, avoiding zero-sum competition, uh, it's hard, because there are reflexive attitudes that want to go back to it in my country. That, that it's easy to go back to that, it's easier to keep count, and frankly, it's always, I remember the president saying one time, he said, we can always have an argument. That's easy. To disagree is easy. You can just disagree and walk away. We can do that anytime. What's harder is to keep working at it to try to, to, to achieve these win-win outcomes. Second, and, and I, I would say from my limited time here as ambassador, this set of issues may be one of the most challenging, which is managing differences and discussions over common values. And I also want to be very precise about what I'm saying here. President Obama, in his speech here, and those are the quotes from the speech, just so you don't have to take it from me, take it from him. State sovereignty is a value that we cherish dearly. The United States of America uh, sees value in the principle of defending sovereignty. We always have, we take it pretty seriously, our own sovereignty and the sovereignty of other countries around the world. And it was so important that it was one of the five things that the president mentioned in his speech here, his first speech in Russia. We also take seriously this other set of values that the president likes to call universal values. Uh, and he, it was so important to him that back then, uh, in the summer of 2009, one of the five things that he stressed in his speech here. It's up to your government and it's up to your society to decide what is the priority of these values for you. And I'm not going to comment on that. That's, that's for you to think about. But I do know that in my conversations with your government officials and with your societal leaders, that you also are uh, struggling about what is the balance between these. And, and it's, not, it's not black and white. It's not 100 and zero. These are, these are values in foreign policy that are in tension all the time. And the, to us... The challenge is to manage these in a way that allows us to keep making progress on the set of security, economic, and value uh, issues that we are working. And that, I think, is, is, is a difficult thing to do. I can see in my own diplomatic work here, this I find to be a, a, a quite challenging thing, a set, especially because a lot of the misconceptions in my country about the way you value these things and the misconceptions in your country. Let me just give you one example from my country. I'm not going to talk about your country and your values. There's a common misconception in my country when I go around talking about Russia that you all love dictatorship. That, uh, you know, that it's in your genes. That it's part of being Russian. The data doesn't... The data, the empirical data, part of which I used to gather here as an academic, does not support that. Well, that's a big assumption that we have to battle. That's a stereotype in terms of getting beyond Cold War stereotypes. That's a stereotype that we have to undermine in order for us to do the kind of work we want to do together. 
Finally, and I'll, this really will be finally. Um, so, uh, right before I came out here, uh, I had one last chance to sit with the president and other uh, senior administration officials and to do what we do well in the Obama administration. And, and I really am proud of this. Uh, we constantly assess and reassess our policies. It's what we did. By the way, a little story about the Russia policy. The Russia policy reassessment that we started with in January 2009 was the second policy review to get completed. I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, um, and it, it, the Af Afghan assessment was done first. We were done second. And so, as a, a, you know, right before I came out, we had a little reassessment of the basic assumptions, the basic theory. We basically had a conversation not unlike the one that we, you, I'm having with you right now. It was super secret and all that, and, but, but, but basically it was almost exactly the same conversation. Um, and we looked at this, and we looked at what's happening here, and you were going through uh, elections and then a change of, of leadership, and we said, is there anything that we've been doing for the last three years that we need to change as a result of where we're at in December of 2011? And the president's answer was no. The basic assumptions, the basic theory that I set out for you is something that he believes is still working for America's national interests. And moreover, because we've had such achievements, he thinks that there's reason to continue with this approach. And that's where I think I'll end. I'll take your questions. Thank you.